If you have your Bible open, just keep it right there where Brother Robert calls your attention to, if you will. The 20th chapter of Acts, I will read the verse following the verse he read. I hope the Lord may be pleased to bless you. Verse 33 of Acts 20. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Probably safe to say that this is a text not often taken for a subject in most pulpits. In fact, I don't know that I've ever heard it read as a text. Do you? I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Why are you so good? I'll guarantee you why I haven't taken it before. As they say in the vernacular, I'm guilty of sin. And I expect that you thought about it, you're guilty too. If not one way or another. Nature being what it is, is covetous. Whether it's a preacher, huckster, in a pulpit, or the so-called humble listener in stand. Self is the first consideration of all people. What made Paul different then? Paul was not any different except by this grace our brother is speaking about. Just by the grace of God, I am what I am. Would you expect to improve on that? Will you be as good as or better than Paul in some other manner? No. But lying behind the statement Paul made is a greater and grander thing than just personal covetousness or the lack thereof. He had commended them to the Word of God, to the Word of His grace, and to the Gospel, and to the ministry, and all of these other things that He described in these verses. And then capped it off by saying, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or pearl. If there's one thing you can learn naturally in reading the writings of the Apostle Paul, it is that he was not nearly as disorganized in writing as some people think. It might take two or three chapters in a book before he gets to his point, but it will be there. And so it was here. He was with these people for what he believed to be and they believed to be would be the last time they would ever lay eyes on one another in this world again. And where they were living, the people among whom they affiliated with in natural things had a great bearing on what Paul said to them there. You will go back in the 19th chapter of this same book In this same city, verse 23, And the same time there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. Here was a man who was putting his talent to use in religion for temporal gain. Demetrius the silversmith. Now, as we'll see, he waxes bold in defense of his God and his religion. But he had a motive in it. Brought no small gain out of the craftsmen. 
whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. We have our wealth. Is that not where the natural mind ever dwells in all cases, in all places, except by the grace of God? Just to turn aside for a moment, think if you will, and may God bless us to think about it, how often the Lord and His apostles spoke to us about mammon, money, riches, material things. How he warned concerning these things. Take no thought was one expression. For ye know that by how that the Lord, though he were rich, yet he became poor, and so forth that we through his poverty might be made rich. Take no thought. In all of these things the admonition was this that the Lord ever careth for his people. And that all of their drive and ambition and seeking in order to have food and clothing and shelter was in the Lord's purview. He'd already provided all of these things for them. He gave the example of the man whose barns were filled, overflowing, so he had to big, build bigger barns. And the Lord comes to him in the evening or in the night and says, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of you. Then who shall these things be? For you see, it was the things that man had ever prayed after. It was no accident then that this same apostle in writing to Timothy said, For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which brings us back to this. That includes religion as well. Have you observed lately that religion is not the favored child that it used to be in the political world? That one by one the big religious money makers are falling like flies? Here they stand today gleaning thousands and millions Tomorrow they'll either be in a prison or in disgrace or somewhere else. Is all of this by accident? Not at all. Because the Demetriuses and the silversmiths of the world, they are going to see that their craft prospers even if somebody else has to quit prospering. And this was the problem in this city. Which was only, if I may say, and may never get to the whole of it this morning, a small symptom of the greater problem. Who was the apostle addressing here? It loved church. His interest and his aim was not what was going on outside of that assembly, nearly so much as what was going on inside the assembly. But this assembly was encompassed round about. This camp of the saints was engulfed by the world. They were residents of this city of Ephesus. And here was the people of Ephesus about to be in an uproar because the religion which this apostle was advocating, as they described it this way, was a hindrance to their religion which brought them their covenant gold and silver and iron. Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone in Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, listen, listen, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. It put them in a right much bad light, didn't it? Here they were carving out statues of silver and gold to the goddess Diane and selling them to the people and says, These be your gods. And oh, how they loved them. They could set them up on the mantle of the fireplace. 
Or they could put them on the stand in the bedroom. Or they could put them on the dash of their car. They could have their little idols with them everywhere they went. They could lavish all of their praise upon them. They could do their devotions to them. And these were, although satisfying to the people, more satisfying to the people that killed them. Because it was by this that they enriched their own coffers. And so they got in an uproar when there was what? Simply put, when there was competition. When there was competition. Now let me ask you, do you believe that the church of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the Son of God is in competition with the world? No. But the opposite is true. The world is in competition with them. And it's when they find they cannot compete that they have all the problems. Think, for instance, if you go back into the old prophet's wordings in, I believe, Isaiah 55, when he says, Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy wine, milk without money and without price. Do you think that wouldn't put the religious hucksters in a bind there? They had been selling what they purported to have was gratifying wares to the people. And that for an exorbitant price. And suddenly, here comes the voice from heaven saying you can have the bread and the milk and the wine. Not grape juice and soda crackers and skim milk. But the real thing, and you can have it without money and without price. Why, this was something that could not be turned down by those who had been given a heart to feel, eyes to see, ears to hear, and a hungering soul after the righteousness which come from God alone. But it certainly did arouse those people in a very malicious way that were in competition with it. Namely, the old false prophets, ministers of Baal, Advocates of Chemosh and so forth will pass from that. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also, listen to this, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised. Oh, can you not see their little hearts just wretched and bleeding here over the temple of Diana? As if they really felt so distraught that Diana was going to be despised. Oh, the heart's deceitful and desperate and wicked. Who can know it? We can know by observations, however, what was in their heart. It wasn't that they had such an affection for Diana and her temple, but what they got out of it. And her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia... And the world worship us. Not quite true. Not quite true. True enough, all of the world seemingly was mad after Diana, this goddess that come down from heaven in the form of Jupiter or whatever. But you may rest assured of this, that out of all kindred, tribes, tongues, and nations, there was yet a little remnant that had not bowed the knee to Baal or Diana or to any other god, because the true and the living God had caused them to give up the idols of the world, to give up the fame and the wealth and the material and all other things, so that they might bow before the one who possessed true riches. True riches. I can quote this, but I want to go turn and read it to you because I think it's appropriate here. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see, and so forth. This was the message to the church at Laodicea. They perceived themselves wealthy. They perceived themselves to be in possession of everything and knew not 
what a wretched, miserable, destitute condition they were in. And it was then the Lord and His angel counseled them to buy of me what? Or go buy from Demetrius what? Demetrius had his gold and silver statues out there. You buy from him at a good price too. But the Lord says you may buy of me. I counsel thee to buy of me. Gold tried where? Gold tried in the furnace. Gold tried in the fire. Gold that had been purified. This was the very deity and essence of Jesus Christ Himself. And how was it that they were to buy it? With the price that had already been paid. For as much, Peter said, as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from the vain tradition of your fathers. What were they redeemed by? But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The gold, silver, and all this business never got this for you. What did? A price that was paid that was infinitely more valuable than the gold and the silver that Demetrius and all of the others had. And this was what? The blood of Christ. This was the gold that was tried in the furnace. This was, this was the gold that come from the fire. And when the fires of God's judgment, when His wrath was poured out without mixture, the cup of his indignation poured in full force upon him. He was capable of paying the debt, for he had wherewith to pay with. He was rich. As I quoted a moment ago, though he were rich, yet he became poor that we through his poverty might be made rich. If then, brethren, we'll be rich in him. Why? Would we strive for temporary riches? But even yet, there is still a greater aim at this subject, I believe. When they had heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Now, you may get a little uppity with me for doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I don't see any difference in what they were saying there than for somebody to say, great is my particular little denomination. Great is our religion. Come here, our preacher. Come worship with us. And all of the other expressions that are in vogue in religion whether it go from Catholicism down to Holy Rollerism, wherever, or any point in between, makes no difference when there are those who can put the emphasis on any name outside of God's given name. They are just as much in error as these here who said, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And now the simple text in the whole thing. And the whole city was filled with confusion. The whole city was filled with confusion. There is not sufficient time to engage in it this morning, but I hope I may touch on it. Here's a little band of believers. And here is a great city. Here is one isolated man who ministers to the other. And he says, I've coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. On the other hand, outside of that little band, that remnant of believers there, is a whole city crying, Great is Diana. And they all with consent covet the gold and the silver and the material things that can be gotten from their religion. This whole city, however, has this problem. Coupled with their praises and adulations of Diana, their adoration and worship of this gold 
idol comes a problem. Do you know what that problem is? What is this problem? Well, there are many, but it's all summed up in this one word. The whole city was filled with confusion. Confusion. That takes us square back to the book of Genesis where we find the beginning of all things. When Nimrod would build a city or a tower to heaven, what did the Lord do? Put the whole mess of them to what? To confusion. To confusion. Brethren, the message is as clear from there to the end of this book that all efforts, all endeavors, all aims to either get food, clothing, raiment, or worship either that which is good for the natural or that which is good for the spiritual all culminates in confusion. Confusion and more confusion. The whole city was given over to it. And in other words, this was a city of Babylon, which is the meaning of confusion. Babylon, confusion, they're one and the same. Change them back and forth. They were confused. And every religious individual in the world today that worships Diana, or worships John Wesley, or the Pope, or whoever it may be, is confused. And the only way their thinking will ever be straightened out is when the Lamb of God is revealed to them. When their hearts are opened and their eyes are made to see that this is the true riches. When they have laid down all of their efforts and all of their aims and all of their ambitions to satisfy themselves naturally with food, clothing, and raiment, or spiritually with any worship other than the worship of the Lamb. Until then, they're confused. You, me, or anyone else. The whole city was given to confusion. Now this is the entranceway into the whole subject, as I perceive it, of the book of Revelation. When we come into the book of Revelation, you see there the beginning of the letters to the seven churches, then the glory of the things that occur around the four and twenty elders as they bow before the throne. And we see they're displayed in all prominence the Lamb of God and the glorious throne of God. And how the chapter after chapter after chapter builds upon these things until we come to that. And I'm not going to get engaged in it here, but just kind of open up on it maybe. The twelfth chapter. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And upon her head was a crown of twelve stars, and she being with child, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. A woman. Now it's no coincidence, or more than one, maybe I don't know which. To me it's the very providence of God that this city given over wholly to confusion had it all centered around this woman God. Now, that's not to say that women God are any worse than men gods. Gods is gods no matter who gets them up, male or female. But it is observable that the aim and the point of this whole book of Revelation, as well as all the other scriptures, if we might say, is to point out the great disparity between this simple woman redeemed by blood and this magnificent, confused woman called Mother Babylon Mystery, the harlot woman, the mother of all of the confused daughters of the world, and how that they both are identified as cities. One a simple little city, but it had this glory that it came down out of heaven from God, and the other ascended up from the earth by man. 
And one of them was great and magnificent and continued to spread and swell. And her branches reached out through all of the world there and had the power and the sway of kings and potentates and rulers and merchants and all of those in authority throughout the world. And the other one was so despised, unloved, and uncared for that she had to hide in the wilderness for a season and be ministered to by the presence of God alone. There appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. Notice too the emphasis on the clothing at the very outset. She was clothed. When you go over and get a glimpse of old Mother Babylon, you'll see that she too was decked out. But where did she get her bedecking? All come from nature. All come from the world. All material. The glory of this woman, notice the sun, the moon, and the stars. Every bit of it is what? God's creation. You see that? God's creation. These are not the things that man can bring into existence like a beautiful garment. He can't create that. He only takes something that's been created and molds it and weaves it. But God spoke the sun and the moon and the stars into existence. And here she is clothed with these. On her head a crown of twelve stars. She being with child, cried, travailing in birth, in pain to be delivered. I'll conclude this morning with this one thought. I hope it's a thought. If you never see anything else, I hope the Lord bless you. Did you see this? Diana, the great goddess of Ephesus, and all the other goddesses, the gods, male, masculine, as far as I'm concerned, can never do. Never do what this woman was. What was that? She was travailing with a child. You think dying is ever going to have offspring? Now, Mother Babylon is going to have many harlot daughters, but she takes on a different, different, different significance. See, even the wicked learn from their mistakes. They don't learn all there is to learn. The children of the heavenly king generally never learn from theirs. They keep on making them, but they know there is one who has learned for them. And they put all of their trust, cast all of their cares upon Him. But they have this joy that Diana and the others don't. They can travail with birth. For there is about to be born from within her a child who will ultimately be called up to heaven. And around this centers all of the glory on one hand, and all of the vile and baseness on the other. One is a harlot, and the other is a withered woman. May the Lord bless you to think on it, and we'll discuss it again at some other time.